Thank you all for being here today. I want to start out by asking you a question. I want to ask you who is a journalist? Because I can make a pretty good case that I'm a journalist. I anchor the news every night, I write, I report, I research. I think I can make a case that I'm a journalist. That's not too difficult. But if I'm this generation of journalist, what's the next generation? I happen to have three boys who have a YouTube channel. It's a pretty successful YouTube channel, but I'm a proud dad, all right? They call themselves the Super Carlin Brothers, all right? And if I am this generation of journalists, and are they the next generation, and where are the boundaries going? And I'll tell you what, Congress can't even decide who a journalist is. Earlier this year, Congress had hearings, and the congressmen were trying to decide with something called shield laws how to protect journalists. It was pretty easy to decide to protect the network correspondents or the guys like me who had everyday journalism jobs, but when you started getting on the backside, they couldn't figure out where to draw the line. They couldn't figure out where the boundary was. And that's where we are right now. So the name of my talk today is Breaking News, but I would submit to you that because of that backside, it's not just breaking, it's shattering. And it's difficult to know where it's going in the future. But I thought, you know, maybe what we could do is we could start over here and we could look at, all right, where has journalism been? And we could kind of go over here and say where it is right now. We can go over here and we can draw the line a little further. Maybe we can see where it is in the future. So we'll start over here and we'll talk about print. Newspapers. What do newspapers do better than anything else? And the answer to that is detail. A newspaper reporter, if he wants to, can report the entire city budget all the facts he can find about an accident. You can sit there at home and you can read those facts and details until you got it. If I were to sit there on the six o'clock news and read you the city budget, how long before you're clicking over to my competition or something entertainment related? It just doesn't work, right? In fact, if I were to give you a test, if you read something to yourself and I read it to you aloud and you took a test, you would always score better on the one that you read to yourself. That's just the nature of the beast. The other thing that print does really, really well is the still picture. Still pictures are so powerful. If you don't believe me, go to the museum sometime up in Washington and walk through the Pulitzer Gallery. And if there are not some pictures in that gallery that stay with you for the rest of your life, I'll be surprised. So that's print. Broadcast is immediacy. The immediacy of broadcast can't be matched by anything else. It's sad to say, but on the events of 9-11, we were all watching, many of us at least, when the second plane hit the tower. We were watching, unfortunately, when all those people leapt to their deaths. And we were watching when the towers crumbled in real time. We were seeing the news happening right in front of our eyes. That's an advantage that broadcast has. And the other thing I would say that broadcast has, the other advantage, would be moving pictures. A still picture is great, but a moving picture, in many ways, is better. When we saw the bombings at the Boston Marathon this year, we could see the bomb go off, we could see the reaction of the crowd, we could see the carnage, we, we, whatever it is that we wanted to see, it was there. We could see beyond that moment in time. So let's say that, for the sake of argument, print wins with detail, broadcast wins with immediacy, and moving pictures and still pictures, for the sake of argument, let's say they play to a draw. And at some other time, we could argue about which one can evoke emotions better, but that's for a different time. So when I was teaching at Virginia Tech from 1996 to 2007, this next argument was somewhat conceptual. It wasn't, it wasn't true yet because the technology hadn't caught up, but since we're talking about boundaries, I would put all those lists on either side, print, broadcast, and I'd say, now let's look at the internet. Because the internet has to win at the end of the day. It has to, because it does all four of those. You've got the text story. You've got still pictures, you've got moving pictures, and at the time we were talking about streaming video, some people could do streaming video, but most people couldn't do it very well, it was clunky technology, now it's every day. So you look at it, the internet has to win, and now we're carrying the internet in our pockets, right, with our smartphones. I stopped teaching in 2007, I think that's about the time that they announced there would be something called an iPhone. Now we're carrying it in our pocket. And so we have this, and not only that, but we can react to the news story. We can put our comments up there. We might even be able to influence the news, right? Right here from our pockets. And we get really bored with all of that, we can play Angry Birds. <laughs> now we add on top of all of that social media. 
And social media is a huge, huge game changer. Why is it a game changer? Not because we're talking to each other, but because social media aggregates audiences. It starts putting lots of people together in one place, and that is a fundamental shift in the way we communicate. Talk about my own personal history with social media. Five years ago this month, I left broadcasting for a little while to try my hand at public relations. And when I left the news station at the time, I was the only one in the station who even had a Facebook account. And the only reason I had a Facebook account is because I was older than everybody else, and I had the Super Carlin brothers at home, and I decided I needed to keep an eye on them because everybody was scared of Facebook. Ooh, we're putting all this information out on the internet. Don't do that. They're, you know, they're going to come to your house and steal your children. Right? So now I'm working at a PR advertising agency, and they are all over Facebook. They are loving this thing, and Twitter, and everything else. And it was, e it was easy to see why. Because we could take our clients' information and put it on Facebook. They had a news release, boom, put it on Facebook. It's out there. They got a nice picture, put it out there. Video, put it out there. All via social media. The clients were loving it. Now, I don't know if this next story is true or not, but Everybody in my business was telling the story at the time, and for the sake of argument, let's just follow along. Philadelphia Phillies, sports team, they would send their players to the children's cancer ward to meet with the children. They would invite the media to come along to show what a great organization the Phillies were. Sometimes the media didn't come, made the Phillies mad. So the next time, the Phillies sent a photographer, a reporter, a writer, and they, they would just push it out on their social media. And this is my advice to clients at the time. If the media won't cover it, cover it yourself. At this point, do the Phillies care? Because let's look at it. Philadelphia Inquirer newspaper, big newspaper, one of the biggest ones in the United States, 306,000 subscribers. Philadelphia Phillies, 1.3 million followers on Facebook and 750,000 plus on Twitter. If they put it out on their media, do they care if the newspaper comes and covers it? Probably not. Probably not. So what happens next? Well, we look at sports teams. We'll stay, we can talk about Justin Bieber. I think he has the second most Twitter followers in the world. But let's stay in the sports arena for the sake of argument. I looked around a little bit. Los Angeles Lakers have 17 million Facebook likes. The um, WWE, the wrestling people, have 13 million. Somehow that came up under a search under sports. I don't know why. <laughs> Just saying. Miami Heat have 8 million. New York Yankees have 6 million. The Boston Red Sox, just prior to winning the World Series, had 4 million. That's a lot of aggregation, isn't it? Those people are talking to a lot of folks, and the media are now no longer involved. Here's the second fundamental shift. Used to be that the distribution system determined who the media was. Used to be it was printing presses and broadcast towers. Now they're doing it without that. Anybody here heard of Philip DeFranco? Philip DeFranco, anyone? There we go the younger people. Super Carlin Brothers love this guy. He's on YouTube. He rants about the news. He's got three million plus subscribers. He started something called SourceFed. It looks a little bit newsier, although by his own admission, it is by people who vomit words. That's what they say. They've got over a million subscribers. He doesn't have a broadcast tower and he doesn't need one. So let's go back to my own history with Facebook. I'm now I'm back in the television news business. I go back to the TV station. We've got 40,000 followers on Facebook. I did a uh, blog on our website. And on that blog, I wrote about a local hike. It's kind of an everyday story. We put it out on Facebook. And for, according to Google Analytics, the next five days, it remained the top five most read stories on our website. It went a little viral locally. We never put it on the air. We never put it on the air. We didn't use our broadcast tower to distribute that information, so how relevant is our broadcast tower anymore? So where does that leave us? Well, I think that in the future, what we'll be looking at is a situation that's much different. Let's follow the Boston Marathon bombings very quickly. When you found out about the Boston Marathon bombings, take yourself back there. Did you find out on your smartphone? Did you find out through social media? You probably did, right? But then you wanted to know more information on what happened. We started tuning into the network news. We started tuning into local Boston channels. If we were searching on the internet, we were looking at the websites from the Boston newspaper, the Boston television stations, because we wanted information from trained reporters. We could see all the uploads that people in the crowd did, and we could even consider everything that the crowd did that day as maybe crowdsourced journalism. 
But are they really journalists? Is that a boundary? I don't know. I don't know. Would Congress protect them? Would, would Congress protect Philip DeFranco? Would Congress protect Stephen Colbert and John Stewart? The guys that we love to watch, right? I did a Google search. 12% of people said they get all of their news from The Daily Show. <laughs> OMG, people! But we go back to the Boston Marathon example, and what we saw is that people started out with the social media stuff, but they eventually went back to traditional media. And so I would submit to you that in the future, we'll probably get our news from journalism centers. It won't be a television newsroom, it won't be a newspaper newsroom, it might be a group of people who have nothing more than a website, and a Facebook account, and a Twitter account, and a YouTube channel, and that's all they're gonna need. But the other thing that they're going to need is they're going to need to adhere to the editorial process. They're going to have to have trained reporters who are gathering information from sources. They're going to have to have editors who are going to vet that information and make sure that before you present it to the public that you've had a reasonable chance to do it and get it right and make it accurate. Because at the end of the day, that's what's going to happen. And I love this. As a journalist, I love the fact that we can know everything all the time. I love that there were 400 people who were playing journalist in Boston by uploading that information. We have all this at our fingertips now. But I'm also a little bit scared because if the models break down too much and no one can rise above the din and aggregate that audience that the advertisers will pay for, guys like me can't make a living. So as a society, I say that we have to be cautious. Journalism is going to change, and we need to figure out, are we getting it from the PR guy at the Phillies or the Yankees or whomever, right? Or are we getting it from a source that is known and trusted? So at the end of the day, I say, when you get information in the future, consider the source, and also look at the person who's presenting that information to you and ask if they are doing the same thing. Thank you very much.